All right. Let's get this on the road. All right, midterm one review. Get excited. This is the real deal. I know you guys are. You guys are ready. Buckle up. We're starting with chapter one. Chapter one, collecting data. The hardest chapter of them all. I hope not, actually. So, all right. So remember, when we started talking... I need my little boy. When we started talking about um, statistics and everything in the beginning of the semester, we made sure to understand, you know, the difference between populations and samples. Excuse me. So populations are fixed. Um, so that means that they're not going to change. Um, and then, so as the population, so, but, you know, it's always hard to take, um, to get an entire population. So that's why we have samples, you know, we take samples from the population that's more feasible. So we go ahead and I draw this a lot. So we take samples from the population and then we use those samples to make an inference about the population. So, um, so that's something to keep in mind because we use, uh, samples and sample statistics because it's hard to get a population. Um, and the, the difference here is that samples are going to be variable, um, so they're going to change as we go. Because um, we usually try to take random samples and whatnot as to uh, make it representative of the population and whatnot. Oh, and as I said here, used to make an inference about the population. Awesome. All right. Nice. All right, so then, okay, this is something that I think a lot of people, like, you know, you guys don't like struggle with it. I wouldn't say that, but like, um, it's something that, you know, comes up a lot. Um, so these are the values that, or these are the symbols we use for sample statistics and population parameters. Okay. So keep in mind for this, I'm so sorry. <laughs> keep in mind for this, that these two symbols are the only ones that we use for a null and alternative hypotheses. Okay. I mean, for either, or I, I don't want to write that way so you don't get confused. Um, I'm just going to write for hypothesis testing. Um, so remember, when you're writing your no, an alternative hypothesis, it's either going to look like, um, I mean, this is for like one sample, obviously. So P equals something, and then, or you're going to have like, for, for the means mu equals something and then the, like i said this is for a null that's why we have the equal sign you're never gonna have um x bar p hat in your um hypothesis testing that's never gonna happen um so this is something just to keep in mind so understanding symbols and you know when we use them and once again since um so populations remember these are going to be fixed they don't change um and then Sample statistics are variable. They change from sample to sample. So that's what it is. <laughs> Send help. Okay, so yeah, so that's the difference between those. Um, so keep this in mind. A lot of people um, find this helpful just to review so you understand which ones to use. Because you guys probably know on like Wiley Plus, you probably goofed up and put like null hypothesis is X bar equals some sum like uh, uh uh mu mu for means p for proportions population parameters for hypothesis testing it's a poem by me a haiku population parameters never mind okay variables <laughs> we're gonna talk about variables a little bit now so variables um remember they they vary that's where they get their name from um, and just understand explanatory variables, what explains the difference in the response variable. And then in order for this to make sense, I'm so sorry, in order for this to make sense, um, our explanatory variable does have to be independent of um, everything, so it can't be affected by anything else. And then because of that, our response variable is going to be dependent on the explanatory variable. So that means that it will change depending on the explanatory variable um, and what changes with that. And then just going a little bit more into um, independence and dependence is just talking about, so something's independent, um, the two things are unrelated and don't affect each other like we put here. And then, um, and often when we do have independence, it's gonna be a randomized experiment because that means they're not gonna affect each other. And then um, <laughs> dependence is when uh, you, have paired, <laughs> you have paired or matched pairs. Um, so for, 
and the thing where it says subjects are often the same in both groups that's where we have um you know we could have a uh, like students who took like a quiz and exam so you're comparing the same student but like their quiz and exam scores so the subjects the same they're just two different scores um so dependent uh once again they do affect each other so um that's if maybe you're trying to find a connection between like you know quiz scores and test scores or something that would be how they're dependent on one another oh we already on chapters two and three we're cruising so now we talked about, well, so already we talked about variables and the different things and statistics that we, you know, have as variables. And now we're going to describe them and like present them actually like visually. So, um, so we talked about, you know, variables just being things that vary, whatever, but there are different types of variables, remember. So categorical are going to be those that are um, labels. Uh, so they, they don't have any sort of values attached to them. Nominal just means that they don't have an order. Ordinal means that they do have an order. So um, ordinal would be something like a class standing, like freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, like, um, ooh, the Olympics are going on. So like bronze, silver, gold. What's up? Connections to real life. Statistics is applicable. Um, <laughs> and then we have quantitative variables, which are going to be those that are um, – they have a value attached to them. They're going to be some sort of numerical value, um, also called measurement variables. And then discrete means they can only take on a set number of values. So like people, because you cannot have 1.627 people. I mean, logically, maybe you can, but logically you can't. And then continuous means that it can ha happen anywhere on that number line. So th these are usually things like... Um, any sort of like actual measurement, like a height, weight, um, you know, centimeters, inches, whatever, that would be continuous quantitative. Oh, baby. Yeah, da, 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 da. Okay. So quantitative data, remember, so we just talked about these. These are going to be those with a value attached to them. Um, so these are the different data displays. So we have our box plot, um, which we use often to talk about our quartiles, if you guys remember. Um, our middle, the, like the box itself is representing the middle 50% of the data. That middle line is always representing our median. Our histogram is going to be showing uh, the frequency of a quantitative variable. So you have your quantitative variable on the x-axis there, which in this case it's age, and then the frequency of each will be represented by the height of the bar. Remember, these are good for uh, large data sets. And the bars do touch. They are friends. Um, <laughs> So, okay, and then we have dot plots, which is similar idea. You have your x, um, your uh, I'm sorry, your quantitative variable on the x-axis, and then the frequency of it is shown by um, each individual op observation is represented by a dot. This is better for smaller observations, just because um, you know each one's represented by a dot. Um, you don't want to use this for larger ones, obviously, because you don't want to put like a million dots in the air. No one has time for that. We have places to be and things to do and statistics to learn. So, yeah. And then also scatter plots. Did I? Yes. Okay. We want to talk more about scatter plots. I just want to make sure. Um, so, scatter plots, remember, there's, um, we talked about these in terms of there's, there's four different ways that you describe a scatter plot. So, direction is either positive or negative. Um, so that's in terms of going from left to right. So keep that in mind. Some people get goofed up on that. So in this case, um, we're going to have a negative, and just using this one as an example. Um, so I'd say this is negative, form linear or nonlinear. Basically, does it look like a line or no? Nah? In this case, I think it looks like a line. Um, hopefully you guys agree. Strength, weak, moderate, strong. You know, how close are these dots to, you know, a the line that they're being correlated to. I'd say that's this one's kind of like moderately strong. You can also go in between them as I did here. Um, they don't have to be a be all end all. And then outliers, um, you know, I, I'd say there's none here, um, but an example would be anything like, you know, out here or something, um, you know, that's outside of the data set itself. But I don't see any in here. So that's just a different way to read it. And then also remember explanatory variable um, is gonna be rep is gonna be always on our x-axis independent and then a response variable um, so our dependent um, variable is going to be on the y-axis so remember that um, something to keep in mind when you're making a scatter plot in your spare time on the weekends <clears throat> 
Okay, so when we're talking about um, when we're talking about uh, quantitative data, we always want to make sure that so when we present it, you know, we get it on this distribution. I'm sure you guys have you're used to seeing distributions um, so far. So, you know, we see different types of distributions that can look, you know, these three different types of ways. I mean, obviously it can look however it wants, depending on the data. Um, but we do have um, just some rules to keep in mind, um, you know, when we have these different data displays. So if something is symmetrical, for example, this would be like the empirical rule, um, empirical rule or like, um, the Z score curve, if you guys remember that. Um, so that would be an example of a symmetrical one. That just means that our mean is equal to our median, which is equal to our mode. So our average is equal to the middle value, and then it's equal to our mode, which is the most occurring value. Um, so that would be like the highest point on the graph, which is like right here. Um, so then skewed to the left, our mean is less than our median, which is less than our mode. Mode is gonna be the highest thing when it's skewed to the left, so most occur commonly occurring one, the highest point on the graph. And then you see you have more spread here on the left. And then skewed to the right, our mode is gonna be the highest, our mode is less than, or excuse me, mode is gonna be the lowest, mode is less than our median, which is less than our mean. So that makes sense, the, the mean is gonna be the highest because it's gonna be where the most spread is, which is on the right here, which is why it is skewed to the right there. So those are some beautiful graphs. I like them. Okay. Um, <laughs> Okay, so the empirical rule is my favorite thing ever. I'm gonna get a poster of it and put it on my wall. Just haven't gotten around to that yet. But the empirical rule is super fun because it tells you um, a lot of information about your data without, with you know, just all you have to do is standardize the data that you had and you can find out all this information. So plus or minus one standard deviation, so right here, it lies 68% of our data. So if I were to shade this in, shade it, shade it, shade. Oh, I shaded too much. I got excited. Let me unshade a little bit so you can, oh, I mean unshade the whole thing. I worked so hard on that shade. Oh. Okay, so I'm gonna shade all this, yeah. So point being, this is gonna be, so 68% of our data lies between plus or minus one standard deviation of the mean. And this goes for anything. Uh, you know, if we had a curve like this, ooh, and let's say it had a mean of four, standard deviation of two. If I were to go, you know, mean of four, and then I was to go over one standard deviation on, e on either side, so plus one standard deviation, then minus one standard deviation, that would give us um, six and two, and then still, according to the empirical rule, apply some minus one standard deviation, 68% of the data lies between these two points here. So same idea, um, this would basically just be standardized to that. So on and so forth for the other two, two for 95, three for 99.7. Empirical rule, know it, love it, memorize it, get a tattoo on it, of it, yeah. Ah, all right, categorical data displays. So remember what categorical data is going to be are um, those labels that we talk about. So that's gonna be, uh, so these things don't have like a numerical value to them. They're gonna be things like ice cream flavors or chocolate flavors or uh, flavors. Of, I, okay, I need something else besides food. Um, car brand, um, colors of the rainbow. Car, Skittles, colors of Skittles. <laughs> um, so those are just examples of categorical data displays that so different variables you could use to um, show or you could represent by these different graphs. So I just have the, the main two on here is bar graph and then two way table. Bar graph is the only one on here that is just showing one variable. So as you can see on the x axis, uh, you have the categorical variable that you're looking at, which in this case is gonna be the campus. So each different campus is your categorical variable. And then I guess you're like, it has your enrollment um, amount here on the Y axis there. So that's, and the bars don't touch here. They're, they're not friends. They got some 
space issues, you know. Um, so the bars don't touch because they, um, because you can't share a value between two categorical variables. If you have, like for like, what, that says, I cannot read. Like, okay, for World Campus and PA College or whatever, the last two, there isn't a point in which, if they touch, there's not a point in which they share on that, you know, on the x-axis, that doesn't make sense. Because they're just being labeled as different labels. You can't like, they're not a common point. So that's why we do uh, make sure that we can, um, that's why we make sure that we don't uh, have them touch or anything. And then the other two bar graphs on here, just same idea, but with two different, um, categories so you know for this one over here this stacked one is just going to be one by visiting team or home team and they stacked them up stack cup you guys remember that stack cups that was lit um and then and then <laughs> there's um oh yeah number of visitors so that's going to be um, our, so this one's just showing like if you have this adult visitors, child visitors. So that's the, those are the two categorical variables here. Um, so they're beside each other. Um, so yeah, and then a two way table. This is also another way to show two categorical variables. So um, the labels here are gonna be gender and then um, favorite sport to watch. So those are the two variables, categorical, their labels. Um, and yeah. That's it. Nice. All right. Oh, risk and odds. Everyone's favorite. I know you guys love this. Everyone cheers when we talk about these. So risk and odds, this is when we're talking about probability. So keep in mind, they are both, um, they're describing the likelihood of, of an event. They both are describing that thing specifically. But there are different interpretations in terms of what a risk is and what odds are. And that comes from the difference in the denominator for how we solve it, okay? So risk is the number. What's the outcome divided by the total number? Um, so, and, you know, this is just decimal fraction percent, obviously. You know, whatever floats your boat. And then we do have, um, and the idea is, you know, also risk is the same problem for same proportion hello same formula we use for proportion of probabilities because that's the same idea for you know your number with the outcome divided by the total um so it's the same idea odds the only difference is our denominator is going to be that's kind of small so you have the number with the outcome which is the same as we have so far but then the denominator is going to be the number without without out the outcome so this is like not including the number with the outcome too you know which is um that's what risk does it's also including that in the not denominator odds is our denominator is the number without the outcome okay and this other equation makes sense too because obviously then you know one minus risk you know risk is the number with the outcome so one minus risk would be the number without the outcome um so this one, you can use this equation if you're already given the risk, but if not, you can just use, you know, number with the, with the outcome and without it to find odds. And odds is always going to be like an odds ratio, like something to one or whatever, whatever. That looks like a sad, a sad guy. Oh, let's make him happy. We love odds. Yeah. All right. What's next? All right, combination of events. So um, this is when we're talking about different events. So, you know, often we just use A and B for examples. Um, and then, you know, the probability of them happening either like together or whatever, whatever, depending on which one we're talking about. Um, so in the other videos, we go a little bit more in depth into the, these, but um, just as a quick review, intersection is going to be um, A and B together. Uh, make sure you understand the different symbols. So you have this upside down U thing. For union, it's A uh, union B. So it's saying the probability of A or B. Um, so and the way I remember this one is that union is saying or. So there's a little dude. Well, no, wait, I don't want that face on him because he's confused. So he doesn't know what he wants. He doesn't know if he wants, you know, this or this. He's like, which one do I want? So this, this, or this. He's so confused. 
So, or this is union, and this kind of looks like a U for union. Okay, anyway, some people have told me that was helpful in the past, so I thought I'd share it. Other people told me to stop speaking, <laughs> but there's that. Um, I'm gonna erase that because it's sad. Um, but yeah, and then complement is everything but um, A. So if you find the probability of A, just one minus the probability of A. Conditional, this is where that, that line in the middle means A given B, which means that B has to have already happened for A to happen, so what's the probability of that? And um, independence is the same idea here um, that we talked about earlier, that they're unrelated um, to each other. So we already went over that. Oh, remember this is gonna be uh, for two categorical variables, so we're still talking about those. Ooh, chapter four, confidence intervals. Love them because it, imply, it applies the empirical rule we out here. So, so our confidence intervals is, um, this is our, uh, co like our common equation that we use here that I have here. So we have our point estimate plus or minus two times our standard error. So basically you're either gonna have an equation that looks like this, so P hat plus or minus, and this is for a 95% confidence interval. As you guys will see, you know, we can have different multipliers, but we're just gonna use a 95% one. So remember, it's not always gonna be two. Uh, this is also, we see this as on 1.96, so don't get confused by that. We just round it to two often. Um, so P hat plus or minus two times our standard error, um, or you can see it as, like I said, um, and this is where these symbols come into play. So here you're gonna be using, so our sample statistic, these are the um, symbols we use for sample statistics. Um, remember now population parameters. So then X bar plus or minus two times the standard error. That's another way that you can write a confidence interval if we're talking about means. Um, and, and you're gonna use that sample, um, sample symbol there too, and then or proportions. Didn't spell that right, okay. So yeah, and our standard error, um, is also, all it is is standard deviation of our sampling distribution. The main idea is that it's from a sampling distribution. Um, so remember, categorical variables are associated with proportions and quantitative are associated with means. So if you don't know if you should use P hat or X bar, um, look into that, see is it, are you using a quantitative variable or a categorical, and then it should bring you to that, um, that conclusion. And then the side note here um, is that, you know, if you increase your sample size, we're gonna have, um, a more narrow um, confidence interval. So remember, we always wanna have a large sample size in order to you know, get a more representative data set. Um, so if you increase that sample size, that means you're gonna have a more narrow confidence interval, which means you can be more confident that the value that you're looking for is within a smaller range of numbers. You'd rather have a smaller range of numbers than a large range of numbers because it's gonna be easier to figure it out or be more confident about, so that's that. Okay, oh, empirical rule again. Just slid that in here, make sure you guys remember. So remember, this is why we use, um, that's why our multiplier is two for a 95% confidence interval, because, um, so you can't really read this, so sample statistic, um, plus or minus, and then the two comes from plus or minus two standard deviations from the mean is gonna be 95% of our data. So that means that, you know, from here to here is 95% of our data, which is how we get that confidence interval of 95%, and then times our standard error, um, and yeah, which can be either, um, so for proportions, just as a review, we're gonna use categorical, and for means, it's gonna be um, quantitative. So that's where it comes from, applying our previous knowledge. That's great. Hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> And like I said, you guys can stop me at any time for clarifying questions, because um, I'll just keep going if you guys don't ask me anything. But, and also, if you're like typing something, like you may type it and I'll go back and anything. So, side note. Okay, so after we get that confidence interval, we're not done yet. Oh no, we wanna make sure we interpret it, you know, and see, you know, what does that actually mean? So remember, or remember the idea that, you know, we have our populations and then, but it's always hard to get, you know, information from the entire population. So that's why we take samples. And then these samples are used to make an inference about the population. 
So we talked about that at the beginning. So that's why for our, um, our conclusion, uh, we want to earn interpretation. We're saying we're 95% confident that the population and then either proportion or mean, so P or mu, because we're making an inference about the population. So you want to make sure your conclusion always talks about on the population because we already we figured out you know the sample stuff we already know that we're trying to make an inference about the population so population proportion or mean the question is between whatever your lower bound and upper bound is which is um, what I just gave an example of here so this is the answer you're actually going to get after you do that you know point estimate um, plus or minus two times your standard error for 95 percent confidence interval or like I said for means explorer plus or minus two times your standard error. so after you do these equations that's where you're going to get the um, a interval like this. When you do the minus, you get the lower, plus you get the higher one. Cool. Nice. Ooh, hypothesis testing. I like these. I think they're fun. So when we're doing hypothesis tests, um, we want to make sure that when we write our null hypothesis, we're always going to have an equal sign. So a null hypothesis is always going to look like this for a one sample. Either P equals a value, or um, mu equals a value. So remember, P and mu are population symbols, so for uh, proportions and for means, okay? Um, so that's the main idea there. Um, you And that's why I'm saying review that chart that we looked at at the beginning for what the different um, symbols are. Because um, remember, for confidence intervals, we were using sample statistics, but here we're using population proportions and or population parameters. Um, so, so yeah, it's going to look like this. Uh, you always want to have that equal sign. And then in contrary, you're still going to use P or mu um, for the alternative hypothesis, which is HA, um, but there's going to be some sort of change. So either less than, not equal to, or greater than. So this is the only two-tailed test. Um, and then this is going to be one-tailed. And then it's also going to be um, left-tailed because it's less than, and then same with this one, it's gonna be one-tailed, and then, whoa, and then this one's gonna be right-tailed um, because it is uh, greater than there. So saying that there's some sort of change, it's gonna never have um, an equal sign. Oops. So yeah, so null hypothesis always has an equal sign, alternative never has an equal sign. Just some rules of thumb there. Who came up with that word? I mean, not that word. Who <laughs> came up with that saying? Rules of thumb. Okay. Any who's? Okay, so after, so remember in mini tab or what, scat, stacky, whatever, you get a um, p value and we want to make sure we're able to interpret that. So remember, our alpha level we often set at um, 0 0.05, which is about 5%, um, not about, it is 5%. Um, so that's, remember, our probability of um, a type 1 error, which we'll get into. Um, so that's our significance level, so we want to compare our p-value to that. So if our p-value is greater than our um, alpha level, um, that we're going to fail to reject the null hypothesis, which means that we can't conclude that there's any change. Remember that we, so this is what we do at the beginning. We always assume that the null is true. We come under the assumption that there's no change going on. You know, so if you're fighting with someone and they're coming back trying to apologize, and you're going to assume that whatever they're going to tell you, that they haven't changed, you're assuming that. But you're going to take data and then see, you know, did they change or not? Nah? So you're going to, you know, take that data on them and then get that p-value and then decide, are we going to, you know, fail to reject the null and say, nope, still haven't changed, or are we going to reject the null and say, okay, you've changed. So that's the difference there. P-value greater than alpha, fail to reject. No change, we're gonna keep it that way. But if our P-value is less than alpha, we got some interesting going on. So we're, we're gonna reject our null hypothesis. And so we're gonna conclude, conclude that there is a change in favor of the alternative hypothesis. Because remember that the alternative hypothesis is saying that there's a change, um, which is why it's gonna be in favor of that. So, so yeah, p-value less than alpha, there is a change, um, then there's going to be no change um, if we fail to reject the null. 
So that is how we interpret the p-value. Whoa, okay. Okay, errors. We all make mistakes. We're only human. Inspirational, but um, so we have our type one and type two errors. These are um, things that we get in statistics depending on, you know, uh, mistakes that we make. Uh, so a type one error is gonna be rejecting the null when the null is true. Um, so this is gonna be saying that there is a change. Um, so saying there is a change when there's not. So when no change, um, whoa. So that's a type one error. Remember, like I said, alpha, as we've been talking about, our significant level, significance level. Um, that's going to be denoted by that, and so a probability of a type 1 error. Um, and we, uh, uh, like I said, commonly said that 5%. Type 2 error is failing to reject the null, so saying that there's no change. So saying no change when there is a change. Crazy. So um, this two-way table that I drew here um, is basically... Um, showing you the, like, you know, you can connect these. So, you know, your decision, whatever you did based upon your p-value. So your decision is based on your p-value. Um, so then you're basically going to see, um, oops. And then if you find out what's true in reality, then you can see if you made a correct decision, which would be amazing. But like I said, we human, we make mistakes. So, or if you made a type one or type two error, which are shown here. So same idea, this is what I just said, you know, so null is true, reject the null, you know, that kind of thing. We denote uh, type one error by alpha, like I said, type two error by beta. Power is one minus beta, which we'll go a little bit more in depth to. Um, so yeah, one moment, next, next slide. All right, so power is, and I understand the language in, for errors and stuff is what really trips people up. You really just need to think through it and be logical as to what, um, what they're actually asking for and what it means. Um, so, so for power, um, like I said, it's one minus beta, so one minus the probability of a type two error. Um, so the probability of rejecting a false null hypothesis. So this is good. Technically power is like, you got the power, it's good. So making it correct, claim that there's a change. So reject the probability of rejecting a false null hypothesis. This is basically correctly um, rejecting the null. So, or, and I'm gonna say this in like eight different ways, so hopefully one makes sense. Um, so correctly um, saying there is a change. So yeah, so inversely related to the probability of making a type two error, obviously because one minus beta, because so obviously if beta increases, um, power is going to decrease, so on and so forth. So, um, so yeah, that's what power is. We got the power. <laughs> All right. Oh my goodness, we're already ready for review questions. Crazy. Ow. All right, let's try these ones out. So, um, like I said, if you haven't done this before. All I'm gonna do is read the question to you, like a nice tutor. And then um, you guys can go ahead and read through the answers and then we'll review them. Um, so let's try this one. So which of the following statements is correct about a parameter and a statistic associated with random samples from the same size of the, from the same population? So read through these options, go ahead and type your answer into the chat box, feel free. Um, and if you don't know, you can say IDK. But if you say an answer, no question marks, be confident, exclamation points, or no punctuation at all. Um, and then we will review this together. So go ahead and try this one out.
Uh, okay. Yay. Good job. You guys are geniuses. But what else is new? <laughs> so answer is B. So remember, our parameter is going to be fixed. So A is incorrect because it's saying parameter will vary from sample to sample. No. C says values of both the parameters. Is it? No, because parameter does not vary. And D also says parameters vary. Nah. So B is correct because statistics vary. Um, and this can also go on to say that parameters um, are going to be fixed. So that's why our answer is B. Amazing. Super. Good job. All right. So which for which of the following variables can we use a bar graph to display it? So try this one out, and we will review it. Great job. Great, Tony the Tiger. Okay, so answer is C because remember for bar graphs, we need to have categorical variables. Um, A is quantitative, B is quantitative, D is quantitative. Um, and also, I mean, so this is, um, I should specify though, this would be like numerical because I've had people be like, well, what if it's A, B, C, D, E? You got me there. It, that that'd be categorical, but this one's gonna be grades on a final exam, numerical ones. So answer C, because this is the only um, categorical variable out of all these. The rest are gonna be quantitative. Quan, quan, quan. Um, so yeah, that's why answer is C because bar graphs. You have that. Remember, bar graphs. The bars don't touch. They're not friends. So yeah, good job. All right, what is the mode of this pie chart? This one should be a quick one. Um, so try this one out. Great job. Germany is our answer. Um, for this one, you just want to look for like the biggest piece of pie, just like you do at Thanksgiving. Word at big pie at. So you <laughs> mind the mode of this pie chart, so it's gonna be the most, <laughs> most commonly occurring. Um, <laughs> most commonly occurring, and then that's gonna be um, so obviously that's gonna be the biggest slice which is looking like Germany. Germany be taken over, so our answer is Germany. Good job. Amazing. All right, 
let's do another one. All right, a farmer is conducting a study concerning the heights of pigs on the farm. Interesting. She takes a random sample of 50 research pigs. <laughs> research pigs, measures each individual's height in centimeters. Which of the following is appropriate for displaying his data? Try this one out and we will review it. Nice, good work, 10 out of 10. So for this one, um, so connecting, da, da, da. so um, this can be just a little tricky. I mean, you guys didn't think it was tricky, but some people do. So bar graph is gonna be categorical, which isn't true because we're looking for, um, so height in centimeters is a quantitative variable. So you want a quantitative data display, so not true. Scatter plot is talking about two quantitative, but we only have one here, so we're not, we don't wanna use that. Two-way table, um, that's for categorical too, so that's why we don't want that one. So dot plot is good, because it's just one quantitative variable, um, which is what we have here. So that's why we wanna use a dot plot. Nice. And I mean, technically, you know, well, and I don't know, I might use a histogram for this just because there's 50 research pigs, but, you know, I'm sure you could do 50. Yeah, if you're having a good day. But yeah, all right, cool. Good job, you guys are on a roll. All right, a kindergarten teacher wants to analyze the number of girls and boys in her class who like vanilla and chocolate ice cream. Interesting, so which of the following is appropriate for displaying these data? If you haven't noticed, this is a common theme that you guys will probably be asked a lot about on, so that's why I'm kind of saying all of it, but let's try this one out and we will go over it. Amazing, good job. So flavors, as I was talking about earlier, is gonna be a categorical variable. Um, but in this case, we have two because we are talking about gender and flavors. So we have two categorical variables. So bar graph won't work because it is good for categorical, but that's for one categorical. So no bueno, scatter plot is for quantitative. So we don't want that. Dot plot is also for quantitative, so we don't want that either. C is the correct answer, because that is for two categorical. Um, so that's why we can use a two-way table there. You would do something like this. Ooh, whoa. Don't like how I drew this one, but we're gonna go with it anyway. So we had like gender, Never mind. It's not gonna look good, I, I changed my mind. But you guys get the point. All right, few more. Holding all other factors constant, how does the width of a confidence interval change when the sample size decreases? So kind of understanding the concept between um, changes in sample size and confidence intervals. Try this one and we'll go over it together.
Nice. Good job. So yeah, remember, we do have that um, relationship between, um, so a decrease in a sample size is going to be, um, I guess, an increase in the width. Such a weird word, width. width. Um, so that means that if our sample size decreases, um, it is going to get wider because smaller sample size means that we're going to like need to capture a larger um, span of uh, data in order for us to be confident that it's within that, you know, be 95% confident, for example, that it's in there. So it is going to get wider. Narrower would be if we increased our sample size and stays the same would be like we kept the same sample size, I guess. So good job. All right, a hypothesis test. Oh, sorry. A hypothesis test for population proportion, P, is given below. So we got our P value, 0 0.033, and we have our alpha being 0 0.05. So go ahead and let me know what you think to describe this data set for A through D, and then we will review it together. Great job. Do you guys do anything wrong? Because it doesn't seem like it. Okay, so um, we know that this is a two-tailed test because we do have that not equal to sign, so we can already say no to B, sorry, rejected. Um, so we're between A, C, and D. Um, so we're try the next thing to decide is this a proportion or a mean. So in this case, it is a proportion because we're using P. If it was a mean, we'd be using mu. Uh, remember population symbols. So we can cancel out C there. Um, so we're between A and D, so basically this is going to be dependent on what we do with our p-value. So here our p-value is going to be um, less than our alpha because 0 0.033 is less than 0 0.05. Um, so we are going to reject that null hypothesis. Um, we're going to say that there is a change. Um, so it is incorrect, obviously. So D would be the correct interpretation of that. Noise, sweet. All right, last one. So which of the following symbols can be used when writing a null and alternative hypothesis? So once again, just reviewing those symbols, because I think this is something that is a constant, just an easy mistake for you guys to fix. Um, so let me know what you guys think about this one. Yay, great job, you guys understand. So um, our answer is going to be for um, null alternative A and B, um, because these are the only two that we're gonna use. Remember, like I said, your null is either gonna be for a one sample B, P equals something, or mu equals something. You're never gonna see something like for your null alternative, like X bar equals, I don't even wanna write it because it's so incorrect. Nah, you'll never see these for, um, hypothesis testing for writing your alternative and null hypothesis there. So our answer is E because it's A and B. So these are the two that you would use there. So to review proportions and then means. Great job. So yeah, these are more conceptual questions, but I think that's what people struggle with. That's why I put them on here. So, um, so yeah, obviously you can check out this review 
and um, all the other ones that I've done on the YouTube channel. I'm actually going to be doing the other review for the midterm on Sunday too at 10 o'clock. Um, tune in for more funness. I'm not sure what I said there. So yeah, if you haven't given me your Penn State email, please go ahead and do that. Um, if you guys have any last clarifying questions, let me know. If not, you guys are good to go for tonight.